Welcome to tonight's Politics and Tactics. This show is recorded due to the fact that PJ has a graduation and tomorrow I'll be driving to DC. But the pandemic is over for a lot of people in America. Unfortunately, so are a lot of careers. The pandemic may be fading from public consciousness, but its impact on firefighters forced to retire and those terminated along with their families have essentially been forgotten. Currently, there are still 13 of the 50 biggest cities that still have some form of draconian vaccine mandate in place. Even in cities where the mandate's been lifted, fired and forced out firefighters have still not all been brought back to work. All of these mandates were put in place with the belief that the vaccinated could not spread the virus. We were initially told by President Biden that the vaccinated could not spread the disease. Even Dr. Fauci stated on CBS's Face the Nation that vaccinated people become the dead end for COVID transmission. These statements helped establish public policy that was based off good intentions and the opinions of so-called experts that told us that these policies were based off settled science. Strangely, we were all taught in school that good science has to be tested, challenged, and it's about asking questions, not silencing them. Only this drift continued to political science designed to consolidate power, stifle dissent, and disvalue anyone who dared to ask the hard questions, all in the name of fighting misinformation. The press Hell, they stopped asking the hard questions. They swiftly moved to repeating the talking points of the day. The lessons from the Bush years and the search for weapons of mass destruction faded. Access for the press was now the new omni point at the expense of the truth. Elected and health officials spoke in absolutes when they were absolutely wrong. Unfortunately, these officials were aided and abetted by the International Association of Fire Chiefs, and even worse, the International Association of Firefighters, who sold out due process, abandoning dues-paying members when they needed their union the most. We caught the International Association of Firefighters leadership unwilling to spend any real political capital to help these firefighters. They spent more time asking about what the specials were on the menu than they did asking about the members who paid the dues that were fired or forced out. I believe the answer comes down to power, ego, and arrogance, leaving fired and forced out firefighters in the cold, forgotten, but tonight we try to give them a little voice here on fire engineering. As always, I welcome the president of the International Association of Firefighters and the president of the International Association of Fire Chiefs. This is the place for cogent debate, everybody's treated with respect and anybody who ever wants to come on this show that has an opposing view you're welcome this isn't about misinformation this is about firefighters who worked hard every day they went to work before the vaccines most of them got covid and had this thing called natural immunity that meant something a little bit before the pandemic but it still means something now tonight let's meet some of these heroes because that's what they are because when you look at heroes, when you look at courage, yeah, this might not be the courage about running into a burning building, but it's political courage. And as Aristotle said, it's the number one virtue. If you don't have political courage, you don't have anything else. These individuals are all individuals that I hold in high esteem that have deep beliefs and followed their beliefs. And they asked the hard question. And for that, they lost their livelihood. We're going to go both sides of the country today. We're going to go from New York to Seattle. And I think one of the Seattle firefighters now is living in another state. But Tom, a battalion chief from New York City who was forced to retire, if you could introduce yourself and kind of give a little background, and then we'll move around the horn, and then we'll start this conversation on politics and tactics tonight. All right. Tom will here. First off, I hope my uh, technical difficulties aren't impacting the recording here. I apologize. Um, yeah, Tom will 38 years at FDNY. Uh, retired, forced mandate. Actually, I don't even say I'm retired. I tell people I was fired. Anytime you're forced to do anything, you, you were terminated. Uh, 
me, I'm, I'm not returning to the FDNY. So if I'm here, if I'm here for um, the men and women of the fire department in New York and around the nation that are still out of work, that are still fighting to get their jobs back. They've been treated unfairly from the onset of this, 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 whatever. I'm not even going to address what it was the last three years that we lived through in this country. But these men and women deserve their jobs back. There's no rhyme or reason why New York City's keeping them off the payroll. Some folks are coming back. Others are being questioned. Asked, they've been asked to give up their uh, their um, civil law, their civil rights. But yeah, this is my introduction. So I won't go any further. I'll, I'll pass that off to the other gents, and we can discuss what's taking place here in New York. So sorry, Frank. No problem, Chief. Andy Pittman, uh, can you just kind of introduce yourself a little bit to our audience? Yeah, my name is Andy Pittman. I'm uh, over in Port Angeles, Washington right now. That's where I've lived the whole time. I was with Seattle Fire Department for six years. I was fired uh, due to the vaccine mandate. Um, coincidentally, uh, about a week after I was fired from Seattle, I was promoted to a lieutenant at my volunteer station where I've been for about 10 years and have actively worked through all of this uh, safely with good policy and good leadership out uh, in the neighborhood that protects my home. And uh, I was at station 31. I was the driver on a shift uh, until this madness ensued. So Andy, the virus can tell the difference if you're a volunteer or if you're a career firefighter is what you're telling me. It, apparently it's that smart. It's, it, it must tune into politics and tactics. Uh, the, the ironic or maybe not so ironic thing was that the piece of paper I filled out for both areas, Seattle and uh, Port Angeles, was exactly the same. It was issued by the Department of Health through the state. And not but least, but uh, Mr. Steve Collins, who's been on this show before and who's been kind of a, a voice and has been fighting the good fight with this. And Steve is also a uh, United States veteran. And I believe you're still in the guard. Are you still in the guard, Steve? Uh, no, sir. I retired after 25 years as a, uh, uh, a W-4 in the US. U.S. Army Reserve. Well, thank you for your service. Uh, introduce yourself to our guests if someone's tuning in for the first time. Okay, my name is Steve Collins, and I was hired by the Seattle Fire Department in 1994, um, and uh, didn't have any problems in the uh, in the fire department. Never had any issues, and then we uh, ran into the vaccine mandate. And uh, fortunately for me, I had enough time to retire. Um, but we, it, but I ended up retiring because of the vaccine mandate. And uh, you, you did say something that um, that I apologize, but it w is actually incorrect. What you said was it was believed that the uh, getting the shot would, at the time of the of the uh, mandate, that it would uh, stop transmission. And in the in the week before the Seattle mandate was put into effect, uh, excuse me, I believe it was in August. Um, the week, just before the mandate went into effect, the CDC uh, came out and said that it, you can still transmit it, you can still contract it. And so the Seattle Fire Department, who was very in tune with what the C CDC was saying, um, was aware that at the time that they fired so many, as many as 70 firefighters in the city of Seattle, that the, that the mandate wouldn't, getting the shot would not stop the vaccine, would not stop the transmission of the disease. And yet they fired him anyway. And uh, and I, I I digress. I got a lot to say. So <laughs> no, well, well, that's why we're here to to give a voice. So so wait, you're saying they basically doubled down on stupid. So in other words, because a lot of the country cities did institute it with good intention, and then they kind of doubled down. And I think a lot of it had to do with ego. They they essentially attached their their ego to a policy. And when new information came in, they couldn't step away and keep their dignity in place. But what you're telling me in this Seattle situation, the information was already starting to come in and the CDC that is correct. And they, was recognizing it. And they, and they knew about it. We actually have proof. Uh, uh, you know, we have a we have a court case and we've done public disclosure requests, et cetera. And we actually have proof. The mayor of Seattle, before they fired anybody, was aware that the um, that the vaccine would not stop transmission and that it would not prevent a person who was vaccinated from transmitting it to somebody else. And in fact, it had already been shown at that point that the vaccine 
a, per, a vaccinated person can transmit it to somebody who is vaccinated. And it had happened in Seattle. And as a matter of fact, that's how I contracted COVID was from a vaccinated firefighter. So you contracted COVID from a vaccinated firefighter. How long were you on the job? How long did it take before they, they fired you? Um, well, I, I spent 28 years as a fireman in the city of Seattle. Um, and then uh, I, my last shift that I worked uh, was the 25th of September, and I came down with COVID sometime a, a few days after that. It started to feel bad. But, but there, was a, there was a guy working with me um, at, the, at overtime on that, on that shift on the 25th of uh, September 2021, which was about a, a pro- little bit less than a month before the mandate went into effect. And so I had COVID right through the mandate and then, you know, was suffering the ill effects of it until, uh, until a while. And then once I recovered, I proved through medical records and I had my blood drawn and we, we proved to the city of Seattle that I had um, antibodies and they didn't care. The city of Seattle has their agenda and it doesn't, and the rest doesn't matter. Facts don't matter. So you even provided your a medical record of your antibodies and that, held no way yes, whatsoever uh it was met with nothing but contempt now andy what was your situation was this a religious exemption was this um what was your your take on the the vaccine if you and you know yeah if, so i was uh i was kind of late to the party with the paperwork because uh i was under the belief that i didn't need to fight for my already given constitutional rights um but after dealing with the leadership at my local department, um, it seemed that the prudent and fair thing to do would be to submit paperwork for both departments. And so I submitted my uh, religious exemption near the end of their deadline, which they wanted in Seattle a couple of weeks before it actually went active. And so I got mine in just, just before the deadline, it was denied. They asked me for more proof of my uh, religion and the, the second time it was approved, and the only thing that I had changed in my wording was, I don't know how serious I can be to show you that I'm willing to risk my livelihood that I use to support my entire family over this mandate. Um, so that one was approved. That was the only change in, in any of the verbiage. Um, so I should have been probably between 60 and 70 spots near the to the end of the line because so many people had gone before me. Um, and then the day that the, act, the mandate went active, um, we decided to do a pancake feed uh, near the headquarters of Seattle Fire Department. Um, at that time, restaurants were still closed. So we just wanted to have a after shift breakfast like we would a lot of days getting off shift. But we didn't want to impose on any local businesses. So we decided to just do a cookout and a bunch of us raised some money and got some money from the churches and we figured if we're cooking outside, the homeless are going to show up. So we made enough to feed the homeless. And it turned into a pretty good deal for us to say goodbye to a lot of our friends and family that were still there. Um, and then we marched up to um, City Hall and dropped off our boots. And uh, that day, uh, there's a bunch of public disclosure requests to prove it. Um, emails started going off between the chiefs and the city council members of Seattle. Um, and... By the end of that day, I was notified that I had an HR investigation uh, started on me uh, for violation of uniform policy because I was in public in a uniform that I bought and I owned. And I was completely 100 percent within uh, the right of that uniform policy. I was never outside of it. Um, And so then I was fired a week later. So I got to get cuts to the front of the line. I was fired on November 9th, even though I was one of the last people to be applying for religious exemption and what they called as a individualized process, which we now know absolutely wasn't, especially since I was one of the first, I think I was number nine fired. I was the last person fired by uh, the then director of HR, Andrew Liu, who has uh, since moved on to a different department. Now, what was the due process? And, you know, I've been highly critical of the IFF, but what was the local you did the local union fight for your due process no um i was i was pretty active in local 27 with kenny stewart and a bunch of those guys before um 
not that I was big into the, the union stuff, but I, I really saw a lot of benefit from what we fought for. And uh, they pretty much sold us out. Um, there was a there was a membership survey of about 70 percent of the Seattle Fire Department was against the mandate and wanted Local 27 to fight and negotiate for us. And they were supposed to have some other members of our department on a essentially a negotiation committee to talk with the city. And that bubbled over and turned into nothing. Uh, they were never invited. Um, and then after we were terminated, a bunch of the members got uh, got paid essentially on our behalf of getting fired. And they had the overtime. Thing that, the thing that blows my mind is that, okay, if the city wanted to institute that you needed the vaccine as a mandate for a new employee to come on, while I still think that that person would have the right for a religious exemption, at least the union would be a little clear on that. But for the union to just lay down over something for incumbents is just, it's mind blowing to me. Now, you know, I've said this before, but I was a union president. I've never lost an election. So you can all stop the anti-union thing. I collect a pension and I'm happy with my pension. But I would advocate for people's rights and due process who drove drunk and who beat their wives. I don't condone either of those actions. So even if the union is against the action, which I don't know how they could be, but even if they were against the action, you pay dues, they have a fiduciary duty to represent you. They have to invoke their inner John Adams and represent you and ensure that the process is fair. And we all know this process wasn't. Um, I was so disheartened. Let me, let me, Go ahead. Yeah, let me interject. Uh, Kenny Stewart is a is a I don't know what I can say on this uh, on the uh, television or on this program. Play, but clear. But 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 Kenny Stewart is a is the the weakest person I've ever met in my life. He um, I paid dues for 28 years. I did not agree with everything that the union uh, did over that 28 years, but I par but I paid my dues. And when when we asked the union what they could do, they said, "There's nothing we can do. You have to get the shot." And so then within, uh, within, I think it was two and a half hours of me being, uh, forcibly retired. The, uh, the union cut all ties with all of us. They immediately kicked us off of all the social media pages. Um, and, and that, that was it that we were, we were done and there's been zero contact, not one, not one for me, not one time has anybody attempted to contact me since then. Not oh. once. And, and, and let me go one step further. Andy, Andy is a young man and he's a good firefighter. Okay. He has attempted to get his job back with the city of Seattle uh, through the public safety civil service commission, the union, Kenny Stewart and Jeff Miller, um, were uh, attended the meeting and didn't say, didn't raise one question, not one question. If you didn't go through the, and, and they didn't do, say anything. And Kenny Stewart says, oh, we're, we're looking into this to see what we can do. Because the Public Safety Civil Service Commission, correct me if I'm wrong, Andy, has denied your, rec your request to come back uh, to work because it's against the rules. There were no rules the way they fired us because they supposedly fired everybody based on uh, non-disciplinary termination. And in the Public Safety Civil Service Commission, there is no such thing as a non-disciplinary separation. So you got fired. And because you got fired, you can't come back. Exactly. Frank, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Yeah. You said it before, sir. Yes. Forcibly retired is fired slash terminated, whatever term. I'm retired, but I tell everybody I was fired. I, yes, I receive a pension. I've been blessed. But I was fired after 38 years with the New York City Fire Department. And to the union's point, they'll always, they're, they, they are making deals with New York politicians. They are negotiating, and that's part of their job, to negotiate for a fair contract, to get good contracts for its memberships. No one's going to argue that. But at the expense of giving up your civil, uh, civil excuse me, your civil service uh, laws that protect you, giving up all your rights, that, then everybody is subject to the whims of political fancy and they could lose their job in a heartbeat. Maybe this one was the, the COVID mandates. What's going to happen in a few years from now when something else comes along, when they want a clean house? There will be no more rights. I, I, yes, everybody likes a good contract, but if you don't have your civil service rights protected, you are, you are nothing but 
we, we all know we're numbers to them, but now we're number that they can easily fire you with and terminate you with at the whim of the political pundits who are in charge of the city at that particular moment. COVID's, this COVID man mandate was obscene, but there's more uh, mandates and more abuses in the, in the forefront if we don't stop this now. Well, let me, let me just say this. Because, I mean, the unions and management are supposed to have a natural adversarial thing, and they negotiate for wages, hours, and working conditions. And this is incumbent. It was a, a change of practice because this hasn't happened before, which means they had to negotiate it, which means they were entitled to arbitration and other process mechanisms, and they gave all that up. The other thing that blows my mind, and everybody knows that I was one of the first union presidents to criticize Harold Shakespeare. However, when Harold Shakespeare did make a brilliant political move back in the day, when the politicians started to stray, Harold shut down the IFF's pack. He didn't go make a speech and go order dinner service while he did that regularly. He actually took some actions and said, we're stopping to give money out of packs. We're not standing with politicians who are going to harm firefighters anymore. And that was a very effective measure. I haven't seen the IFF stop giving money in packs, and I haven't seen them stop standing with politicians, but they don't seem to be standing with Andy Pittman or the New York City firefighters or the Seattle firefighters. And Steve, I'm going to go to you next, but I want to make sure this is clear to our listeners because some people kind of get in their own head. And I talk about this a lot throughout the country and they're like, yeah, well, maybe they should have just got it. I'm like, well, where do you work? Did they have the mandate? They're like, no, they had testing. If you look at only what I say, 13 or 15 out of the top biggest cities, Connecticut, blue state Connecticut. Not one firefighter was fired in Connecticut. The vaccine and the virus affected COVID in Connecticut, just like anywhere else. Not one person was fired. We had testing. Houston, Texas is also a very blue city in a red state. They had a testing option. So this wasn't the only way. So how could this only be in Seattle and in New York City and some of these places where basically it seems like the politicians, the health officials and the union, everybody together failed you guys. And it's just mind blowing. Steve, go. Uh, so so there's a couple of points. One of them is that the mayor of Seattle put out something called mayoral directive number nine, and it was the guidelines for for getting the COVID vaccine, and it, it talked about employees, it talked about contractors, all of the above. So, so uh, what Mayoral Directive Number Nine says is, if you are exempted, now both Andy and I re received religious exemptions. If you have a, if you receive a religious or a medical exemption, and you are exempted from receiving the vaccine, then you are required to, you know, mask test and social distance as a condition of employment. So what I'm saying is Andy and myself both agreed to do so and yet were fired anyway. So we were in fact fired in, you know, uh, uh, in violation of the COVID directives. And then the other thing about the, the other thing is, is that how you know this is about politics and this is not about a disease, not about a, a vaccine is that if they, you know, they, the city of Seattle now is short several hundred firefighters. I mean, Andy probably knows the number better than I do, but it's significant where they actually put vehicle rigs and out of service on a regular basis. Um, and if it was about a vaccine, why could they not have put everybody on unpaid leave until the, until the mandate was lifted? Well, and why couldn't they say, Hey, you're all going to get fired uh, or on unpaid leave or whatever they want to call it. And then when the vaccine mandate is, when the vaccine requirement is lifted, which it is now, I think it was February wait, 7th. Wait, 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 you know wait, wait a second. Wait a second. I want to make sure this is perfectly clear. So the vaccine mandate is no longer in effect, and we're still looking at approximately 70 firefighters that don't have a livelihood anymore? Yep. Well, a good portion of them required needed money to pay for their family, so they went and got jobs elsewhere. There's guys in Tennessee, there's guys in Texas, there's guys in uh, uh, numerous firefighters, experienced, tenured firefighters from Seattle, went uh, just down the road, literally uh, 30 minutes from the city of Seattle, 
and are currently working in Central Pierce. Who, who uh, you should have that chief on on your uh, on your show because he he's a chief. He's a fire chief. Hey, that that guy hey, is a is, that guy's a fire chief. So one of the hey, things hey Frank, that, let, let Andy is, let Andy is, get is, in here and then I'll go, go right to you, Tom. Go, Andy. So one of the Sorry things that, that uh, brother from New York keeps saying is that we were terminated, and and in Seattle they created this soft term saying involuntary separated. Well, that's what they wrote in the letter to us. But when you look at the HR records, it says terminated. And there's public disclosure requests that show the director of the Public Safety Civil Service Commission, uh, Andrea Shealy, and the HR director who fired me discussing what terms are we going to use to fire these folks. And so now I'm applying for employment at other fire departments because the mandate's been lifted. And I'm having to fight this uphill battle because in the fire service where we all act with integrity, but the leaders of Seattle don't, um, they throw around language that is very damaging to my reputation. I have, I have worked absolutely amazingly hard to make sure that my reputation is that of a solid firefighter. I'm the guy you want showing up. And so you put terminated on my record it's an uphill battle for the other. And, and they understand the politics behind me getting fired at the next department, but they still have to dot their I's and cross their T's. So I'm fighting that battle right now, trying to get on another department. And it's, it's something that I brought up to the public safety civil service commission last week at my hearing, when I appealed their decision to not reinstate me from the February mandate lift, I said, you guys are, are using words interchangeably and that's not the way it is. And you guys should understand that because your woke politics chastises me for using the wrong words or I'm misidentifying somebody. But on the other side of the token, you're playing games with language to ruin my life. And uh, and it, it can't be taken lightly. Language it, it matters. It definitely can't be taken lightly because if you can control the language, you can control people. Tom, Absolutely. Uh, weigh in. Tom looks like he's disco dancing here. Go, Chief. Go ahead, weigh in. Yeah, yeah. It, it, same, same applies here in New York City. The, the, the mandate was was rescinded by Mayor Adams. I, I don't recall a, a few months ago. Uh, immediately, members uh, who I've worked, worked with very closely uh, applied for reinstatement. And there was no clarity. There was no uniformity. There was no general consensus on who they reinstated and who they did not. They, it seemed like it was arbitrary and, and, and capricious and punitive, to be perfectly honest with you. But they have taken some back. There's still about 10 other, 10 members that are uh, aggressively applying to get their jobs back and they're given no reason. Some, are, some have been asked to give up their civil service rights, sign waivers. Others have not. Again, there's a lack of leadership, and, and you mentioned it before. There's plenty of leadership in the fire service on the national level on the fire ground. Nobody's ever going to dispute that. But, but Frank, to your point that you said earlier, moral leadership, moral courage, it, it, it's lacking here, and we need it. And, and, and gentlemen, uh, we, we, yeah, we're beating up the unions, and, 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 and they, they deserve to be taken to task, no doubt. And, but you know what? I saw here in this grassroots effort, we got this group, the Bravest of Choice. I know you guys have, you know, united yourselves up there. But we found, I mean, we're also beating up the politicians. But I got to give credit where credit is due. We have this grassroots organization, Bravest of Choice. These guys really organized. They got out there. They, and, they, and they got in contact with very friendly politicians who were very friendly to our cause. And, they, and these politicians, Councilwoman... Joanne Ariola and her, 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 her phenomenal aide, Phyllis, and, and, and Vicki Palladino, Councilwoman Val Palladino. These councilwomen took on the fire commissioner in the public. They took on the mayor. They are advocating on a regular basis. They, and they will not cease until every firefighter gets their job back. Hey, I'm retired. I was just like you, gentlemen. I was forcibly retired. Fired. I'm not going back. And I'm in the same corner right now with uh, Councilwoman Ariola and Councilwoman uh, Palladino and Phyllis. I'm not going to stop. I'm in Florida here trying to experience some retirement with my wife. But I want to make sure that every one of those men and women who were from Bravest for Choice and others like, need to get their jobs back. COVID is over with. The mandate's over with. 
let's get back to normalcy. Let's get this country back to normalcy. Let's get each individual cities back to normalcy. Very, very well said. Sure. Steve, is there any, now I know Seattle's a little bit different than New York, but is there any politicians that have been sympathetic that have tried to help out the firefighters? I mean, we're not, we're not even no. talking. No. No, not one. The, I mean, not not one in Seattle. There are there's one or two around the state. Okay, but but if but there's not one in Seattle. Not one. Oh my God! Can, yeah, you, see, it's, yeah. It, it, it's it, it's a, it's a, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. No, it's, it's frustrating. I'm agreeing with you. Sorry, Andy. Wait, yeah, wait. They, they, so, so one of the things that people fail to understand, you know, I've, I've been traveling around in the last year doing uh, training around the country. And so I get to talk with folks in Texas and Indiana and Canada, and, and they don't understand how dirty the ball game was in Seattle with, with the COVID mandate. You know, the way that we went about this in the, in the initial two to three weeks of the announcement was that we're going to play ball. We're going to be honorable and this is all going to work itself out. And the, the closer we got to the drop dead date of the mandate being active, the more we realized that this was a sham. Um, you know, one of the things that we offered was uh, daily testing before shift to be able to uh, come into work. And they told us that that was too expensive and that was too cumbersome and they couldn't accommodate us in that way. And then within a month of us being fired, their COVID rates skyrocketed. And so they started handing out tests to everybody in the department and telling them you need to test before you come in. And this was in an email that we all have on record. Um, and then actually about three weeks before the mandate was announced, uh, King County Medic One, UW Medicine, uh, I think Fred Hutch or somebody else or one of the large hospital agencies around Puget Sound, they had already embarked on a PPE study for the uh, rate of transmission from firefighters to patients or vice versa. Um, and I think there were about 1,800 uh, cases that they looked at and there was only one transmission that they were able to narrow down. And, and you, you gotta remember that each time you call 911, there's at least four on an engine, two on a medic. If it's a fire, there's gonna be you know, 40 plus of us. So you look at the actual patient contacts between four to six to 40 on a fire and then the hospital staff and the aftercare staff, the patient contacts is hundreds of thousands. And there was only one traceable data point that they were able to accommodate. So what it really said was that the way that we were doing PPE and decon, um, which was not new, it was, I believe, adapted from the avian flu in the 2000s, was very effective. And that we were adhering to it strongly because we didn't want to bring this stuff home to our families. My wife's got an immunocompromised uh, system. So I've got four kids. I don't want to be getting people sick. And I genuinely care about my job. I don't want to be the vector when I go to work. And so the study proved that what we were doing was highly effective. And so we offered that to the administration as a, as a talking point. Hey, look at what we're doing already works. You can accommodate us. They literally threw it in the garbage and said, "We're not going to, we're not going to pay attention to that. That's not an accommodation." And while this wasn't a study, we we experienced a very similar thing in New Haven. Our members weren't getting it from the calls. The first firehouse that had an explosion was because a community spread. A firefighter came in, got it from home, and basically wiped out the entire shift. So that's we were how we all got it. We were well, the same thing. The, we all one knew of the other that. things. The gov we all knew, remember that if you went to a tuberculosis call or a meningitis call, you wore a HEPA mask and N95, and if you didn't, you would get fined by OSHA for having a serious violation where injury or death is likely to occur. But then all of a sudden, when they failed to prepare for the pandemic, they said, oh, you can wear a cloth mask. You're good to go. Don't worry about that. Steve. One of, one of the I, things I, that happened in Seattle was early on in the pandemic, Scoggins and uh, Mayor Durkin decided that they wanted to be uh, progressive in the COVID response. So if you got COVID at work or you said you got COVID at work, you got two weeks of paid time off. They never rescinded that until the emergency order was lifted. So there was a, a big influx of people getting sick at work 
and taken that two weeks off. And so I spoke publicly about that against Goggins and said, if you guys wanted to cut your overtime rate, go back to the original policy, which L and I backed and we all thought was pretty prudent, but they didn't. And so it cost the taxpayers and the city uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in overtime. Um, millions, and it, millions and millions. It was honorable at the intent because we didn't know where we were with COVID, but a year later it was very clear what was happening. And, and so they didn't want to say that they were wrong or amend any policies to be accommodating to anybody. They still they, don't want to say they're wrong. It's obvious they were wrong, but they don't want to say that they're wrong. It, it, in New Steve, York is City. there any lawsuits that have come out of Seattle that are working their way slowly through the system, as painful and grinding as that is? There's numerous. Ours is one of the, one of them. Okay. Yeah, and Tom, you're right. It's slow. It's a glacial a glacial pace. But but just back to reiterate one of the just to to reinforce what Andy said. We all volunteered. All of us volunteered to use masks to test every day. One of the guys on my crew volunteered to buy a camping trailer and park it in the uh, parking lot and stay there as, as a uh, as a accommodation. And it says in the mayor's memorandum, it states it very clearly that if you really receive a religious exemption or a medical exemption, that you are required to mask, test, or social distance as a condition of employment. We all agreed to those conditions. And ironically, all. we all know as firefighters that the N95 masks, as uncomfortable and burdensome as they are, they work to prevent transmission. But that's the only mask, not the other mask. And the thing that still blows my mind to this day was when FDIC came back, I'm on a plane, I'm flying to go lecture at FDIC, and everybody's got their mask on to the point where they're yelling at people if their nose is just showing a little. Then all of a sudden, food service starts, and everybody takes off their mask. And I'm like, this is all theater. This defies all common sense. And the government lied to us over and over again. And Fauci finally admitted that the reason that he said initially that masks don't work is he didn't want to run on N95 masks so first responders can have it. So his credibility should have been questioned right there, right from the beginning when he was willing to lie to the American public. And then it morphed into, OK, every mask works, which, again, we knew was a lie. Um, Steve, so what's sure. going on now? I mean, this is just. And, oh, you said the fire chief's name, but didn't say he was the fire chief. And our listeners don't know who the fire chief is. I know that chief he was Harold Scoggins. Issued, I know he was issued a very stern rebuke by a federal judge for destroying public information by deleting his text messages. But what's the chief of Seattle's name? His name is Harold Scoggins. And he came from California. I believe he came from Glendale, California. And he was hired because he was woke. He's a member of Black Lives Matter, the organization, not the, um, not the idea. And, uh, uh, and he, he, was, he was conspiring with the leader of the CHOP in Seattle. That, that his name was Raz Simone, who's currently being indicted for rape. And he's on video who um, handing out AR-15s. So Harold Scoggins um, was texting him with his city-issued telephone. And Judge Zilly ordered him in, uh, I think it was July, to maintain all of his text messages. And on October 8th, he went to uh, the Apple store and had them all deleted. So we know all his text messages essentially about this COVID issue will magically have disappeared as well. They, they're he, all gone. He had his phone phone erased. Well, that was uh, that that may have been before the COVID thing, uh, right. but but Chief Scoggins was uh, he learned from that event and knows better than to text on his cell phone now, and so he he doesn't send emails. I mean, it's been stated that I mean we have plenty of emails, but not very many from him, and so because he does, I don't believe he uses email. It's been stated to me that he doesn't use email. But he hasn't taken a position to try to bring firefighters back and understand that on the, on the contrary. On the contrary, I request I, I, I fall in the fall into the category of people that can come back. I requested to be reinstated and he personally denied it. Now I had a chief of operations from a city 
fire department. I won't say which one uh, say to me, oh, well, but they were insubordinate. So it was a rule. So it should be followed. And how can you trust them? And I, I said, are you really are you really saying that? I mean, didn't you ever hear of good trouble, civil disobedience? Haven't you ever heard of I think Dave Rhodes and I don't think he was speaking on this issue to keep, keep him in context. But Dave Rhodes talked about um, uh, what he say at FDIC, something about dutiful insubordination that. Well, I'm going to go to a battalion chief for New York City. So do you think there's a trust issue with somebody who had a religious exemption about the vaccine that that would carry over to them not following an order on a fire ground? Can, can we, leave, you know, you, you're a chief for, you know, you're a firefighter for over 38 years. Can, can you weigh in on that? Because I thought that that was the height of absurdity. And I try to respect everybody's opinion. I, 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 I agree. Uh, what, what, what the city's trying to do here is create a new condition of employment after the fact. We, we we had conditions of employment where you could live certain facts that you had to that you had to agree upon before you were hired. They made a condition of employment after the fact. Religious accommodation should have been acknowledged by everyone that that, that applied for them if they had legitimate religious exemptions. And and there were many of them. And I, I just want to backpedal a little. And I apologize for my technical difficulties to, to, to address the, the, the financial difficulties that the cities are all going to address. New York City alone is going to be paying financial, uh, is going to have financial difficulties for what Mayor Bill de Blasio did for years to come. Not only did he destroy the fire department and get many people that, that were highly trained and now you're going to replace them. New York City as well. I have a friend of mine, highly trained specialist in his, in his, in his, uh, his subject matter expert at. It would cost thousands, tens of thousands, quite even hundreds of thousands of dollars just to replace this one gentleman. Now, to my two gentlemen friends, my two firefighter friends in Seattle, and, and, to, and to you, Frank, New York City here has had at least four to five sudden deaths of firefighters. And, and not all the not, not guys, guys were in good shape. Guys were in good, strong, young firemen. In fact, one of the young firemen was in the fire academy. Yeah. And, and it was called a medical episode. Four or five of them. In, in the two-month period, and I'm sure there's others that we're not aware of. So this is this is a fairly uncommonly discussed topic. Medical episodes, young men, strong, in shape, all of a sudden, uh, to, to use the, the expression, died suddenly. Are we discussing that? I mean, this is, I mean, I, I mentioned Bill de Blasio's financial burdens that, that he's exposed to New York City, but look at what he's done to the families of these members. Because... 40 to 50 percent of New York City firefighters that were vaccinated, I would say I would say most of them were coerced. Yep. They were coerced into taking that shot. We can never do, those guys have a right to be heard as well. Some men and women could not say no. They needed to take it to provide for the family. And there's no shame in that. Absolutely no shame. I was in a, I was in a good spot that I could walk away. Some couldn't. Those men and women who were coerced to take that shot. Some of them may, but we'll never be able to see the autopsies, but some of them may have died as a result of those forced vaccinations. That, that should be a discussed topic as well. You know, that, that's a real interesting point because that is true. You know, it comes down to force over freedom. And if somebody is coerced, in other words, they know their livelihoods on the line, you know, as we would like everybody to stand on principle, I was fired for filing a OSHA complaint while I was on probation way in the very beginning of my career my record was was expunged but the fact is i learned really quick that principal won't feed your family or keep your house warm and me and my wife had to get through it together before i got hired in new haven so so i think i love those who have the political courage to take the stand and they need to be recognized for the sacrifice they made but that doesn't take away from the people that didn't have a choice that had a say, okay, I got to get the shot, even though I don't want to get the shot because of, I don't know what else I'm going to do because, you know, Andy, you're cutting trees down, right? Is that, is that what you're doing or was you helping yeah. somebody out? Yeah. I, I uh, climbed trees and cut trees. In fact, uh, I, I had to fill in uh, two weeks ago for a buddy who just about cut his leg off, um, you know, and I'm still volunteering. So I go to, go to quite a few fires out where I live. Um, but it's, you know, I don't have health insurance for my wife and kids. 
Uh, so, cutting having, trees, uh, so cutting trees is a great job. You're able to provide for your family right now, but it's not a career and it's not what you love to do. And here no. for all these years, six years in Seattle, 10 years as a volunteer, you were willing to make your wife a widow and you have children. Got four. And, and your four kids, parent, you know, not having a father for the community they serve and essentially the politicians, the union every, and the health officials, everybody just basically wiped their hands of you and said, you know, you don't have any more value to the community, even though you were working during the entire pandemic and you were willing to wear a mask, you were willing to take steps. You weren't just standing on a hill saying no. You were saying, hey, I'm willing to do whatever makes you comfortable. Just don't fire me. And here they're not even requiring the mandates gone now, and they still won't bring you back. I mean, this just blows my mind. Uh, Steve, I know Andy committed the. So go ahead. Andy, com Andy committed the cardinal sin. He failed to bend his knee because because that's what it's all about. Let me make a point. There are I know for fact that there are members of the Seattle Fire Department who have fake vaccine cards. During the conversation, we call them a louder mill hearing. Uh, one of our members said to the chief, he said, uh, do, you, do you know that there are people who have fake vaccine cards? And the chief acknowledged, yes, he knows that there's fake vaccine cards out there. And Andy said, or not Andy, but the other, the other gentleman said, um, well, are you going to investigate that? And he said, Chief Scoggins, Chief Harold Scoggins, stated that, the requirement was to provide proof of vaccination. It's not his job to look into whether they are their actual documents or not. So he knows, he knows that there's people that didn't get the vaccine, but they did what they were told. They, they provided proof, false proof, but they provided proof that they, that they had, uh, had gotten the vaccine when in fact they hadn't. And the chief of the fire department said, it's not his job to investigate whether the documents were accurate or not. So Andy, a great man with integrity, takes a stand, is willing, is is what you want a child to look at and say, that's a firefighter, I want to be one day, who's who represents the very best in humanity and saying, hey, I have integrity, I'm willing to do anything it takes to keep my job, but I don't want to get the shot because the whole premise is faulty at this point. I'm a healthy Male. I don't want yeah. to so, so one of the things that that you know hasn't been discussed a lot is we all swore an oath, every one of us, and that's why we're here. We're we're willing to lay it down for for our citizens, the people we swore to protect. And uh, I'd written this a small excerpt before the mandate went active, and I said, you know, somebody's going to suffer, and nobody in a fire cares about a shot or or any of that. They don't care for a guy or a girl. When we're pushing down the hallway, all they want is to not take their last breath full of smoke. They want us to come in. And uh, within a month of us being fired, uh, there was a family who called 911, a 13-year-old boy. His dad was having a cardiac event. And, uh, you know, the, the brothers in the police department, they got fired as well. And so they were already short-staffed. And and uh, the delayed response was 13 minutes to my station's uh, first in district up in uh, North Bay, Seattle. And so that kid sat there at 13 years old and watched his family die. And so we talked about insubordination and, and the consequences of not taking the shot. Well, the medics that day said, no, we're going to go in. We're tired of waiting for police. We know they're not coming because there's not enough of them. And they violated policy. And they went in without a police uh, officer going in to clear this call because they could hear what dispatch was saying about this kid watching his dad die. They knew that the address that came up on dispatch's um, computer, it, it had a, a note on there saying that SPD had to go in and clear it. Well, that was an old uh, tenant of the address. So the medics went in and they found the dad in cardiac arrest and they weren't able to save him. And this is all public. Um, the family is now suing the city of Seattle for $10 million just on that one case. So like Chief was saying out in New York, you know, the downstream effects of these political decisions, uh, they've got hundreds of millions of dollars behind them when this is all settled. But 
That kid watched his dad die needlessly. Seattle used to have one of the highest survivability rates in the world because of the Medic One program. And now there's a 13-year-old kid watching his dad die when our station's like four minutes away. And we go on CPRs there all the time. We perform with excellence every time. But their politics got in the way of our great survivability rate. And that's the thing. I mean, that there's so many of those stories. And that's the thing that really sucks is we all swore an oath. We're all willing to lay it down. And uh, these politicians got in the way of that kid's uh, dad raising him. And now he had to go to a funeral for his dad when he didn't need to. He was in a savable rhythm 13 minutes before. That is truly tragic. And, you know, Tom, when you and I came in, and Steve, when we came in the fire service, everybody wanted to be a firefighter or a cop. Nowadays, it's tough across the country to get good quality candidates that want to be firefighters or cops. You've seen a drop in New York City, too, of having trouble recruiting compared to the past as well, right? Certainly, New York City Police Department, they're having difficult times recruiting. In fact, I, I know of a, a friend of mine, his nephew was on NYPD. As soon as he had the opportunity, he left to go to the state police. Uh, they are leaving as soon as they hit their 20 year mark. They, they are on their way out. The fire department is also having a tough time recruiting as well. But, but to the political uh, aspect of this, we, we recently had a member who was forced to retire. I'm not going to say his name, I'll keep his privacy. He was forced to retire last year, uh, was recently honored by the uh, current inhabitant of uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. If I'm not mistaken, the current inhabitant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue believe that all firefighters and cops and EMS workers around the country should be mandated to get this vaccine. Meanwhile, putting a medal around this member that's been forced to retire, terminated because he refused to get that vaccine. Certain politicians, and we all know who they are, and it might be the current inhabitant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and it might even be the current mayor of that lives in Gracie Mansion, might even be the current fire commissioner. The only time they want to be around men like they're in this group right now is when they can take political advantage of it. That's it. At a member's funeral or, or to put, pin a medal on them. But when it comes to taking real courage and protecting the interest of these men who put their life on the line for their families, and for their loved ones and for the cities that they served, it's an absolute disgrace that we even associate with those people that just use us for their own political expediency. No, that's Sick. why, I, Chief, that's why we're so glad that you're a powerful voice in this. I know that you spoke before city council or I may have their, their terminology wrong, but I've seen you speak and you deliver a powerful message. And Andy, your courage is just second to none. And Steve, I mean, you've been you've been leading this and trying to put these everybody together and trying to give them a voice. And everybody I've talked to of all three gentlemen on here are held in the highest esteem. These are people you want commanding the fire or going down that hot hall or cutting over a weakened roof. Um, where they these are the people you want when your loved ones having a heart attack. And this is just tragic beyond tragic because it's only happening in our largest cities. And it's not even happening in all of our largest cities. So, you know, I think, Steve, you might have said it earlier, you know, arbitrary, capricious, you know, when it comes to the law, anything with the law, when it comes to policy, it should be narrowly tailored. None of these things are narrowly tailored. Every one of these policies is arbitrary and capricious. And it doesn't follow the science. It only follows the political science. And everybody's being used as political pawns. Steve, weigh in. Well, in 1986, when I entered the uh, Armed Forces of the United States, I swore to uh, uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. Part of the Constitution of the United States is the First Amendment with, of religious freedom and freedom to speak. Okay, that has been taken away from America now. So I, I'm here to, to raise my voice to say this needs to be rectified. No, and, and what, what a powerful voice. I mean, President Reagan said we're only one generation away from losing the freedoms that we have unless good people take take a stand. And, you know, the one thing that the fire department does a good job at is honoring our dead. But quite often we forget about the courage of those who live. And that's why I commend each and every one of you. And, and Andy, you know, you were just starting out, you know, anything that I can do to personally help you. Uh, please uh, reach out because 
because I know how tough it can be. And this is this is a tough time, and it's real easy to feel alone. But there's a lot of people that are pushing for you. And I mean, I know Steve, you're you're forcibly retired, but you spend a lot of time on this issue away from your family trying to push this. And, and Tom, here you are trying to enjoy a vacation with your family. Your wife probably hates you. And here you are on with us at Fire Engineering. You know, we get it and we appreciate you guys coming on. And, you know, hopefully we can keep bringing this issue to light because the pandemic may be over, but so are careers. And we need to keep talking about this because people need to start paying attention and we need to get these firefighters back to work. Um, We're at the witching hour. I'm going to go around the horn and let everybody say their uh, final words. This won't be the last time. You're welcome, all you on Politics and Tactics. Um, anytime. A matter of fact, that we might even continue this conversation June 2nd on the radio show if any of you guys are available. But uh, so let's start with Andy and then we'll go we'll go around. Yeah. So one of the things that was told to me early on in my career in Seattle is if you see something, say something, um, you know, because we had a couple of firefighters die and the newest guy on the on the crew didn't say something because the culture at that time was you don't speak until you're spoken to. And so I bring that up because this culture that's been created in Seattle Fire Department, this culture of fear of speaking up, um, is has been cultivated over the last few years. Uh, I was on a fire. It was we had two fires that day. Steve was at the second one. I think he was at the first one. Uh, he did a VES on the Charlie side. Um, before that happened, I was on the Alpha side and I was pushing line in, and a guy's bottle went off two minutes into the fire what the hell's going on? So he comes crawling out. He's low air. He didn't swap his bottle out from the first fire. And so I get a call the next shift and it was, Hey, did you see Steve VES on the Charlie side? Well, yeah, that's his job. He's on the truck. And so they were trying to jam Steve up for doing his job, but there was a guy going in the front door with low air bottle on the first in line. And they didn't want to talk about that. And so raise your hand when you see those things and speak up, that's the time to speak up. Because by the time you get down the road to where they're implementing a mandate, the culture's already been set in stone and you're gonna be bulldozed, just like our union did with us. And I thank you guys for giving us the opportunity to speak. And Chief, thank you for fighting over there because we had some chiefs on our side uh, in the leadership of Seattle and, and they got some big black eyes in the process and they fought tooth and nail for us uh, before we were done. And, and I can't say how much that meant to us on the line to have chiefs up above us fighting like it was their last breath. I, it's, it's amazing that, you know, you'd have firefighters who'd risk their lives in a second, but won't risk their career in, 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 you know, in a week. Uh, Steve, go ahead. Okay. Um, so you talked about honoring our dead and the unions and the, and the fire department. It's not, it's, it's with quite a number of leaders in the Seattle fire department. Let me tell you a quick story. Uh, November 2nd, I, I had had COVID for the month of October and had been very sick and had pneumonia on November 2nd. One of our battalion chiefs who I was good friends with went missing hunting in uh, Eastern Washington. Um, there were, there were a, a number of us who on our own accord, I was still sick. Um, but we went to Eastern Washington to uh, search for this man. Um, and as it turned out, it did not have a good outcome. So, uh, but fast forward four months, the leadership of the Seattle Fire Department, there was a, uh, of the people who are get, who got fired, most of those people, a good number of those people, one guy came from Idaho all the way over who was getting fired from the Seattle fire department to search for that chief's uh, chief and try to rescue him. So uh, about three months later, they had a memorial and none of us that had, had uh, resisted the Seattle fire department, none of us were invited or even informed. And that, and that's not just Harold Scoggins. That is the leadership of the Seattle fire department. We were, we are, are currently pariahs. We are outcasts. Not because of any other reason that, except for the fact that we did not bend a knee. And the union, they, they celebrate every single person who retires unless you retired because of COVID. Then you are forgotten. Like I said, the union booted us off of their Facebook page and their Instagram and all of that other stuff within three hours of being terminated. 
Oh my God. This is unbelievable. And that's Kenny Stewart. Chief of uh, Tom, go ahead. All right, gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity. Frank, I really appreciate coming a second time. And just, uh, we've all heard, and rightfully so, at, 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 our, at our brothers and sisters' funerals, never forget. But I'm going to tell us right now across the nation, never forget uh, Andy and Steve. Never forget Sal, Joe, Matt, and Tim over here in the FDNY, guys that want to come back. Yes, never forget those members that have given their ultimate sacrifice of their lives, but never forget the men and women who fought during COVID, that did the right thing, that went to work every day, and unfortunately had to pay not the ultimate price, but they paid a price that they are still living with today. So let's not forget those men, Matt, Sal, Joe, and Tim over here in FDNY, and Andy and Steve over on the West Coast. God bless you, and thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Firefighters swear an oath to the Constitution and to protect our citizens, and that oath to the Constitution and the 14th Amendment protects due process. And due process has been put by the wayside, and these firefighters forgotten and kicked to the side. This needs to change. Chiefs, you need to step up. Individuals that are still on the job, you need to step up and speak out for these guys. They had the courage to speak the truth when everybody else was lying. It's just, this is just wrong. Um, that's it for politics and tactics tonight. Um, I wrote about this subject in the new book, Command Presence, available on fireengineering.com. It's capitalism. We always got to sell a little bit here. But um, I also thank uh, Editor-in-Chief Dave Rhodes, who doesn't always agree with my opinions, but that's okay. That's what makes America great, and we appreciate uh, Fire Engineering for giving us this platform so that we can talk about the issues affecting the fire service. Again, if you have a dissenting view on this, Dissenting views are okay. If you're the president of the IFF or the president of the International Association of Fire Chiefs, please come on. You will always be treated with respect. But let's have a cogent conversation where we can go back and forth. Um, you're leaders. You shouldn't be cowards, and you should come on the show. We would welcome you with open arms. Uh, Mark, that's it for Politics and Tactics tonight. Uh, you can take us out.